Welcome to the Servants of Grace podcast hosted by Dave Jenkins. Our podcast exists to provide trustworthy expository messages through the Bible and faithful answers to your theology questions. Now for today's episode, let's join our host, Dave Jenkins. Well, welcome back to the Servants of Grace podcast. My name is Dave, and I'm the host for this show. And on today's episode, we're going to continue our series through the book of Psalms, looking today at Psalm 91 and in the shelter of the Most High. Would you please join me now in prayer? Heavenly Father, we thank you that your word is true, that it's living, that it abides forever, uh, because you are behind your word and your promises as 2 Corinthians 1.20 says, are yes and amen in Christ alone. So we thank you, Lord, that not only is your word true, but you are true. You are a God who never lies, who tells us the truth about who we are and what we are, and yet you remain the same. You are from everlasting to everlasting. You are the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. So Lord, as we consider now this great and majestic psalm, In Psalm 91, I pray, Lord, that you would help us. Help us, Lord, to know you more, to love you more, to cherish you more, to treasure the King of kings, the only one who is utterly righteous and holy and majestic in all of your ways. So, Lord, help us as we open now this great psalm, Psalm 91. Help us to learn more, discover more about who you are and what you're like and why that matters. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you that it's reliable, it's trustworthy, it's without error, it's without the possibility of error. It's binding, it's sufficient, it's clear, and it's for all of life to point us to Christ. So, Lord, as we open now your word, help us, Lord, to be teachable, to hum- to be humble, and to learn what you would have us to learn. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Well, if you have your copy of God's word, go ahead and open it to Psalm 91. Psalm 91 says this, He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, My refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. For he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his pinions, and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and a buckler. You will not fear the terror of the night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in darkness, nor the destruction that wastes at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it will not come near you. You will only look with your eyes and see the recompass of the wicked. Because you have made the Lord your dwelling place, the Most High, who is my refuge, no evil shall be allowed to befall you. No plague come near your tent, for he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. On their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. You will tread on the lion and the adder, the the young lion and the serpent you will trample underfoot. Because he holds fast to me in love, I will deliver him, I will protect him, because he knows my name. And when he calls to me, I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will rescue him and honor him. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. Well, this is the reading of God's holy word from Psalm 91. Now, the opening of this psalm, it opens with a couplet that is beloved and it's comforting as any other in Holy Scripture. When it says, He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. This verse affirms, writes Matthew Henry, that great Puritan commentator, that all those who live a life of communion with God are constantly safe under his protection and may therefore preserve a holy serenity and security of mind at all times. Now, believers in all kinds of trouble have gained strength of heart by meditating on these inspired words from the Word of God. Charles Spurgeon tells of a period early in his ministry when a deadly plague coursed through London. Coming home from yet another funeral and concerned for his own safety, Spurgeon passed a shop where the merchant had hung a handwritten sign bearing the opening line of Psalm 91. 
which said, The effect upon my heart was immediate, Spurgeon later wrote. I felt secure, refreshed, girt with immortality. I went on with my visitations of the dying in a calm and a peaceful spirit. I felt no fear of evil, and I suffered no harm. Now, Psalm 91 has a number of valuable features. It's intensely theological. It portrays God's ability to care for his people in moving terms. It's also a personal, as the unnamed psalmist applies this truth to his own heart and urges his heart to a more fervent, trusting faith in Christ. It's a Christological psalm, a message of which most pointedly fulfilled in the experience of Jesus Christ. And Psalm 91 offers promises from the mouth of God that inspire believers to find their satisfaction in Him. In Psalm 91, 14 and Psalm 91, 16, it says, Because He holds fast to me in love, I will deliver Him. God tells His servant, With long life I will satisfy Him and show Him my salvation. Well, the first thing that we're going to see today is the believer's salvation. The believer's sh- salvation and shelter. And so the theological emphasis, it comes first in Psalm 91, as the names and the saving mercy of God are presented as a refuge for the believer. Four different names for God appears in verses 1 through 2, each of which provides a strong basis for our confidence. God is El Elyon, the Most High Shaddai, the Almighty Yahweh, the Covenant Lord, and Elohim, the Creator God. These four names give a sufficient hope to all who know the Lord. So as the Most High, the Almighty, God is sovereign in authority and infinite in power. As Lord, He has pledged His covenant, care, and love for His people. As God who made heaven and earth, according to Psalm 121, 2, He can help when every earthly solace fails. And because of who and what God is, believers may dwell in the Lord as a refuge. Now, the word for shelter, it carries the idea of a hidden compartment, which is why several versions render it as the secret place. Corrie ten Boom tells of how her family in Amsterdam was modified during the uh, yeah was modified during the Nazi occupation to create a secret compartment where Jewish refugees could hide from arrest. Now, God's protection is like that for a believer. A sense of peace that the unbeliever can scarcely imagine comes to our heart when we trust in the Lord, like a secret refuge that the world cannot reach, like that secret compartment in Corey Ten Boom's house. And so saying that believers abide in the shadow of the Almighty, as Psalm 91.1 says, it reminds us of the great rock beneath which desert dwellers find life-preserving shade. And so dwelling under God's shadow may also be a reference to the tabernacle, where Israel drew near to God as the Ark of the Covenant rested, rested under the shadow of angelic wings. So John Calvin notes that believers dwell under his shadow in the sense that they experience with a rich extent his uh, protection reaches. Now, Psalm 91.1 may be taken as one of the most compelling descriptions of prayer that is found in the Word of God. Taking shelter as a secret place, we're reminded of Jesus' teaching that we should go to a private place and pray to your Father who's in secret in Matthew 6.6, an analogy that Jesus may have drawn from this verse. And so in this light, we see Psalm 91.1 as providing an awesome depiction of the life of devoted prayer. And so to dwell in the secret place of prayer with the Most High is to abide in the shadow of the Almighty, that is to meet with God in spirit and experience the reflection of His glory in our souls. Now, Psalm 91.2, it adds that God is my refuge and my fortress. And the word for fortress as is Masuta. It refers to a mountaintop stronghold. After the Roman destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD, a thousand Jewish Zealots occupied the Masada, a mountain fortress in southern Judah, where they held off an entire Roman legion for months. While the Masada was finally breached, the fortress that is God in his sovereign omnipotence can never be overcome. 
Now, in speaking of God's protection, the psalmist emphasizes his personal relationship and access in Psalm 91, verse 2, which says, My refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. In Psalm 91, 4, it depicts God as responding in kind, using a surprisingly intimate illustration of devotion and care, saying this, He will cover you with his pinions, and under his wings you will find refuge. Now the image is of a mother bird who draws near to her vulnerable chicks when a deadly hawk soars above looking for prey. So spreading her wings over their little bodies, she, she both shields them from evil and comforts them with a protective presence. Likewise, when believers draw close to God in faith, the sense of God's nearness drives oppression from our hearts. Charles Spurgeon writes, who will not herein Uh, see a matchless love, a divine tenderness, which should both woo and win our confidence. And even as a hen covers her chickens, so does the Lord protect the souls which dwell in him. Let us cower down beneath him for comfort and for safety. And so if God's care is soft like a mother bird's feathers, it's also firm and strong. As verse four of our Psalm says today, when it says his faithfulness is a shield and a buckler. Now, the King James Version reads that God's truth is a shield and buckler, the latter a small, round shield, so that the believer is covered all around. This is a valid idea since God's word does protect us from spiritual assault. But it's better to take this verse 4 as citing God's faithfulness as a shield and armor for his people. You see, God does not desert us in time of need. God stands between us and every assault. And while it's certainly true that Christians can suffer harm, by the sovereign will of God, it is not possible for even such harm to do us evil. Now we can look at Joseph, for example. Looking back on the bitter betrayals and the cruel circumstances, he could affirm God's overruling faithfulness in Genesis 50, 20, saying, You meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. And when Abraham faced danger from the five kings of the east, the Lord made a promise that Psalm 91 extends to all believers in Genesis 15, 1, which says, Fear not, I am your shield, your reward shall be very great. And so in all these ways, his divine names, his secret place, his, the high fortress, his motherly attention, his firm faithfulness, the Lord is a shelter on whom we may wholly rely. Yet we must not fail to note the essential role of faith in this psalm. It is he who dwells in the most high shelter who will abide in the shadow of the Almighty, according to Psalm 91.1. The psalmist not only celebrates God as a high fortress, but he adds, My God in whom I trust, in Psalm 91 2. God is your shelter because you have made the Lord your dwelling place, in Psalm 91 9. And there is a tendency among some commentators to say that the shelter referred to in Psalm 91 belongs not to all believers, but only to those who have sought the Lord with great fervor. Spurgeon states the blessing here promised are not for all believers, but for all who live in close fellowship with God. And yet under this approach, it is only those who actively seek God's faith in prayer, who carry God's word constantly on their hearts, and who live with a zeal for the pleasure of God, who can claim the privileges of Psalm 91. An example is seen in the biography of the missionary martyr Jim Elliott, who from the early years showed an unflagging zeal for the Lord. The record of this remarkable life was titled Shadow of the Almighty from Psalm 91, the psalm that we're looking at today. The meaning was that here was a man who dwelt constantly in the presence of God and who therefore lived with the bold assurance of God's blessing. Does that mean that God shelters only the most consistent and the zealous of believers? Well, the answer is no. This is God as he is presented to each of his people. God is present as a shelter and a fortress for you. The Lord desires to cover you with his wings and protect you like a shield. God is unchanging towards all of his people as Psalm 118 repeatedly celebrates when he says, his steadfast love endures forever. And Spurgeon is right that that we must enter into God's shelter through faith in Christ alone. 
We must dwell in the shelter of the Most High in order to abide in the shadow of the Almighty. Because Jim Elliot dwelt in God's presence, being constantly aware of God's greatness, he lived with peace and a courageous purpose in life, just as we may do in the same way. Psalm 91 invites all of God's people, weak and strong, to set their hearts firmly on the Lord, reminding themselves of all that he is to us in time of need. He is always there for us if only we will find our shelter in the Lord. Do we remember God when trouble comes? Do we lay hold of his sovereignty, his power, his faithfulness? Do our hearts look to him when fearful like chicks running under their mother's uplifted wing? Do we rely on God's faithfulness to shield us from danger? The answer is, is that we are far more likely to receive the comfort we need in trials if we have been habitually drawing near to God. And so in this respect, Psalm 91 serves as both a challenge and an invitation. So if we lack a sense of God's presence in time of need, might this suggest that we have neglected to dwell in his courts? Now, Psalm 91 invites us to join in acclaiming my refuge and my fortress, my God and whom I trust in Psalm 91 verse 2. Now let's look at the believer's security. Having so wonderfully portrayed God as our shelter, now the psalmist vividly depicts the believer's security in the Lord. Starting in Psalm 91 verse 3, he asserts God's protection from unseen, unforeseen dangers when he says this, For he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the deadly pestilence. The fowler's snare is a bird trap into which the unwary may stumble. Likewise, the deadly pestilence is sudden in its coming. The snare may have the idea of temptation in which believers may be entangled if we do not walk closely with the Lord. Matthew 6.13 says, Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And it's true that God's people do get tripped up and sometimes even afflicted. And yet Psalm 91 reminds us how often we're protected, even if unawares. How little we think of thanking God after arriving safely from a journey or upon rising from sleep after night. And yet it is God's protection that enables us to avoid innumerable threats to our lives. Now, for many people, it is not so much the trials of life as the fear of danger that paralyzes our life. For such Christians, Psalm 91 offers a remedy through our faith in the Lord, as it says in Psalm 91, 5 through 6. You will not fear the terror of the night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in darkness, nor the destruction that wastes at noonday. The point is to remind us, as Calvin writes, that those whom God has taken under his care are in a state of the most absolute safety. Mention is made of the fear of the night because men are naturally apprehensive in the dark, and our fears are apt at such seasons to magnify any sound or disturbance. A famous instance of faith overcoming fear was given by the Confederate General Stonewall Jackson amid the deadly hail of many balls on the battlefield of First Manassas. And when asked afterward why he showed not the last sign of fear, he answered, My religious belief teaches me to feel as safe in battle as in my bed. God has fixed the time for my death, he said. Now, one reason why Christians can have confidence in the protection of God is the unseen ministry of the angels in our time of need. According to Psalm 91, 11 through 12, it says, For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. On their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. Hebrews 1, 14 describes these unseen holy angels as ministering spirits sent out to serve for the sake of those who are to inherit salvation. Now, many people are superstitious in focusing on guardian angels assigned to them, but scripture speaks of legions of angels who are on hand at God's command to preserve his people. In reality, our guardian is God and the angels are his servants for the protection of believers. And while we catalog the specific pledges made by Psalm 91 to preserve us from unforeseen dangers, we should not downplay its even more comprehensive claim. Verses 9 through 10 boldly assert, Because you have made the Lord your dwelling place, the Most High, who is my refuge, no evil shall be allowed to befall you. No plague come near your tent. And so the psalmist does not mean that Christians are going to breeze through life without troubles. 
And though we're not told who wrote this psalm, it is unlikely that a believer who spoke of such wide-ranging trial would, uh, should have had no personal experience with them. And still, he boldly claims, the writer of the psalm does, that God's protection so that the Christian is not fully touched by the plague of, of sin and evil on our world. And as a result, verse 7 and 8 of this psalm exclaim, A thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it will not come near you. You will only look with your eyes and see the recompense of the wicked. And so this promise especially applies to our spiritual warfare against Satan and his evil servants. Spiritual conflict seems to be in mind in the promise of Psalm 91 verse 13, which says, You will tread on the lion and the adder, the young lion and the serpent you will trample underfoot. And though we may suffer greatly under spiritual assault, the New Testament reminds us of the ultimate victory through the conquest of Christ, which is what Paul writes in Romans 16, 20, which says, The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. An example of God's wide-ranging care and protection is seen in the testimony of Corey Ten Boone. I early noted how her family built a hiding place in their home to shelter Jews threatened by the Nazis during World War II. In February 1944, an informant betrayed the Ten Boons. Corey, together with her sister Betsy and her aged father Casper, fell into the hands of the dreaded Gestapo. Huddled together in the police station, their minds assailed by terror. They were led by Casper in prayer, quoting from Psalm 119, 14 through 17, which says, You are my hiding place and my shield. I hope in your word. Hold me up that I may be saved. And so the events that ensued involved shocking suffering. Corey and Betsy were beaten to extract information. Casper was offered release if he would promise to cease aiding the Jews. In calm words, he refused, and within 10 days, he would die from the strain of prison life. Corey and Betsy were sent to the dreaded Ravensbrück concentration camp in Germany, where they experienced countless horrors. Working as slave laborers while their health plummeted, they clung to God as our shelter. Their victory took the form of maintaining the grace of Christ in their hearts as they ministered to fellow prisoners and sought to show the love of God to harden Uh, Nazi guards. And throughout the ordeal, God fulfilled the promise of Psalm 91. He provided for their spirits by arranging for them to possess a smuggle Bible, which they used to share God's word with other people. He allowed their meeting room to be infested with fleas, with the providential result that the prison guards gave them space to study the Bible and pray. Corey and Betsy's desperate prayers were answered with supernatural deliverances. The most notable concerned a small vial of vitamins, which was vital for maintaining life in the midst of freezing cold, starvation, and sickness. At first, Corey sought to hoard the small amount of precious medicine. Betsy countered with the Bible story of the woman whose jar was never empty, and so they decided to share the few ounces freely. Corey later wrote, Every time I tilted the little bottle, a drop appeared at the bottom of the glass stopper. It couldn't be, she said, and yet it happened this day and the next and the next until an odd little group of spectators stood around watching the drops fall onto the daily rations of bread. And so when Corey tried to reason out how so little liquid could be administered to dozens of people every day, Betsy answered, don't try too hard to explain it, Corey. Just accept it as a surprise from a father who loves you. Shortly afterward, a nurse smuggled in several jars of vitamin pills. We'll finish the drops first, Corey reasoned. But that night, no matter how long I held it upside down or how hard I shook it, not another drop appeared. You see, God has spread his wings over them in their time of need, perhaps employing angels to keep them safe until their work was done. Sadly, Betsy died in the prison camp, and for months she had led suffering women to faith in Jesus Christ and rejoiced with those lingering near death over the approaching rays of heaven. Gazing now at her sister's dead body, Corey was struck by the evident blessing, and she says this, For there lay Betsy, her eyes closed as if in sleep, her face full and young, stronger, freer. This was the Betsy of heaven, bursting with joy and health. Her, even her hair was graciously in place as if an angel had ministered to her. 
Corey herself was released from prison by a clerical heir just one week before the women her age in the camp were all put to death. She understood that God had intended her to bear Betsy's witness as found in her book, The Hiding Place. Betsy had urged Corey with her dying words, must tell people what we've learned here. We must tell them that there is no pit so deep that God is not deeper still. There can be no more fitting commentary on this touching scene than the words of Psalm 91, 9 through 10. Because you have made the Lord your dwelling place, the Most High, who is my refuge, no evil shall be allowed to befall you. No plague shall come near your tent. Now let's talk about the believer's Savior. The pledges of Psalm 91 applied especially to the experience of Jesus Christ, who is the believer's Savior and Lord in these lines. The second of Satan's three temptations of Jesus included his quotation from Psalm 91, 11 through 12. And so taking Jesus to the pinnacle of the temple, Satan urged Jesus to test God by throwing him down. After all, God promised he will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone in Matthew 4, 5-6. This occasion is the one time recorded in the Word of God when Satan quotes directly from the Bible, prompting Calvin to observe the devil is a sufficiently acute theologian. The problem was is that Satan wanted Jesus to misuse the promise by presuming on God's protection. And so Jesus' answer showed his superior grasp of God's word in Matthew 4, 7, which says, Again it is written, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. And so, as usual, Satan's manipulation of Scripture involved an omission. Psalm 91 verse 11 states that God assigns angels to guard you in all your ways. And the point is, is that God guards us as we're seeking to serve Him in the ordinary callings of our lives. We are not to live recklessly under the foolish premise that God is committed to our protection in the course of sin or neglect or apathy. Jesus said that we're not to test God or to tempt God, but we should receive his promise of protection as an incentive to courageous obedience. And so it was just such a life that Jesus followed perfectly during his days of mortal weakness on the earth. God responded by fulfilling the pledge of Psalm 91. And so we find that after Jesus overcame Satan's temptation, the devil left him, and behold, angels came and were ministering to him in Matthew 4:11. Jesus was immortal against all the threats until the appointed time for his sin atoning death. Now, dwelling constantly in the refuge of God's presence, his faithful life received the fulfillment of Psalm 91, verse 10. No evil shall be allowed to befall you, no plague come near your tent. It is therefore in the life of our Lord that the final promises of Psalm 91, they find their fullest expression. In Psalm 91, 14, God says, Because he holds fast to me in love, I will deliver him. I will protect him because he knows my name. Now, when we think of Jesus' prayer life and how the Father so readily provided all that was asked by his Son, it says this, When he calls to me, I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will rescue and honor him in Psalm 91, 15. Now, the greatest instance of this fulfillment was the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. When he suffered on the cross, the religious leaders mocked him. Matthew 27, uh, 43 says, He trusts in God. Let God deliver him now. If he desires him, they scoffed. And God answered him by raising Jesus from the grave and exalting him to the highest place of glory in heaven, according to Ephesians 1, 20 through 22. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation, declares Psalm 91, 16 in conclusion. Jesus ascended into an eternal reign of glory above. Isaiah 53, 11, it speaks of the satisfaction that was the Father's reward on the cross when it says this, out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Christ trusted in his Father throughout his saving ministry for us, and God fulfilled Psalm 91 by preserving and even protecting him until the coming of his hour to fulfill his atoning purpose. And in raising Jesus from the grave, God granted Jesus his highest satisfaction in gathering his people to salvation, declaring them righteous through faith in the gospel and forgiving all of their sins. Now let's talk about the believer's satisfaction. 
It is in Christ that God's people receive their fullness of what God promised in Psalm 91. The psalm began by extolling the believer's shelter in God and then the believer's security under God's care. This leads to believers' own satisfaction as the promises are extended to us through our union with Christ in faith. In the final verses of Psalm 91, they catalog the, in, the inheritance of believers in Christ. The first is a summary of God's promise to the believer in Psalm 91, 14, which says, Because he holds fast to me in love, I will deliver him. I will protect him because he knows my name. This language assumes that we will be constantly surrounded by danger, both temporal and spiritual. Our calling is to hold fast to the Lord in love, clinging to the example of Psalm 91, 2, which says, I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. John Calvin says, God does not promise believers a life of ease and luxury, but deliverance from their tribulations. Psalm 91, 15 says, I will be with him in trouble. God says, I will rescue him and honor him. Now, God's promise is to hear our prayers and answer according to our needs. It says this, in verse 15 of our psalm. When he calls to me, I will answer him. And this promise serves as a grand theme of this psalm. To dwell in the shelter of the Most High is to abide in the shadow of the Almighty. God's first answer to prayer is the peace that he supplies to our hearts, as well as the marvelous provision of all that we need. And so faith in this promise it results in the calm repose by Paul in Romans 8, 28, which says, and We know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. Now, the final promise of Psalm 91 is the most wonderful. In Psalm 91, 16, it says, With long life I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. Now, in the Old Testament, a long life symbolized the blessing of God. And what matters more than the length of our days, however, is the joy that we experience in the Lord for whatever time we have on earth. Indeed, when our satisfaction rests in the presence and the provision of God, our hearts long not so much uh, for more and more days here in the world, but increasingly for enjoyment of the glories of heaven with God. Spurgeon writes, the man described in this psalm fills out the measure of its days. And whether he dies young or old, he is quite satisfied with life and is content to leave it. And so the Christian, therefore, does not even fear to die, knowing that our longest life of greatest satisfaction awaits beyond the grave and especially in the return of the Lord. So trusting in God, we express our confidence in the promise of Psalm 91, 16, with the answer given in Psalm 23, verse 6. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Now, the great condition of Psalm 91 is a living faith in God and his word, looking to their fulfillment in Jesus Christ. Have you said the words of verse 2 to Jesus, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust? You see, if you've not come to faith in Jesus Christ alone, let Psalm 91 remind you of the perils around you, especially the dangers of your sin to your eternal soul. What could keep you from the shelter, the security, and the satisfaction of Psalm 91, all of which are found in the Savior to which it points? The angel told Joseph, Jesus' earthly father, what to name him in Matthew 1, 21. You shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. If you will open your heart to Jesus in love, having come to know his name by believing the message of the word of God, God promises to you in Psalm 91, 14, I will deliver him, I will protect him. And if you are a believer in Christ today, let Psalm 91 remind you of the great wisdom of living close to God in the spirit of prayer. Psalm 91, 1 says, He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. And so let these words serve as, as both a model for a life of peace in his strong arms and of loving security under the caring wings of a Savior, King, and Jesus who loves you and is faithful to you. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that your word remains and it always will remain. That you are faithful to your word because as Titus 1-2 says, you are a God who never lies. You are a God who always acts according to your revealed will in the word of God. And we're so thankful that we serve a faithful King and Lord and God whose promises are yes and amen in Christ. So Lord, as we look out into our world today, what we see, it concerns us. It causes us to be anxious and discouraged and 
uh, even sad and to grieve. Lord, and yet as we look at a psalm like this, what we see is you are a God who hears, you are a God who cares, and you are a God that we can trust, that we can turn to in times of tribulation and difficulty and challenge. So Lord, I pray for my brothers and sisters in Christ that we would look to you in faith and confidence, knowing that you are a God whose promises are yes and amen, as you've said in your word, that you are a trustworthy God, that you are a God who is holy and just and perfect and majestic and wonderful in all of your ways. So Lord, help us to cling to the cross. Help us to look to you, to trust you, to grow in our love and dependence and the utter sufficiency of Christ alone. In Jesus' name, I pray, amen and amen. Thank you for listening to the Servants of Grace podcast today. If you enjoyed the show, please subscribe, leave a rating on the app, and share our episode with your friends and family. If you'd like to, you can follow us on Instagram at Servants of Grace, on Twitter at Servants of Grace, or by searching Servants of Grace on Facebook. You can also find this podcast on the front page of our website at servantsofgrace.org.